lupus means the wolf. Um, without going into a long history of lupus, which uh, is a lecture for some other class, um, the wolf is um, violent and unpredictable, and that's where lupus and the disease comes from. This happens to be a lupus vulgaris rash. Lupus is defined by research criteria. It's pretty important to understand that the research criteria are helpful but are in no way diagnostic or not diagnostic of lupus. Most of the slides depict at least one of the criteria that is satisfactory for lupus. If a person fulfills four out of 11 criteria, they have definite lupus. If a person has three out of 11 criteria, they have probable lupus. If a person has two out of 11, that's possible lupus. There are several circumstances where a person can have an undifferentiated connective tissue disease or an overlap syndrome. An overlap syndrome would imply that a patient fulfills the criteria for, let's say, lupus, and they also fulfill the criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. In the old days, that would have been called rufus. But these days, all the overlaps, whether they're Sjogren's, scleroderma, lupus, myositis, and several others, if they overlap, and if there are criteria for multiple diseases, and people fulfill multiple criteria, those people are said to have overlap diseases. One of the most confusing things to explain to patients is somebody who has features of autoimmunity, which I will get to and you will see pictures of. When somebody has features of autoimmunity and they have one, two, or three criteria, you cannot formally label them as lupus simply because of research criteria. In my mind, I know that if you have an ANA and a DNA, double-stranded DNA, by definition, you have lupus. Why? Because the sensitivity of an ANA is 100%, and the specificity of the DNA is 99%. And by the way, the same goes for the Smith antibody. For the board exam, if they were to ask you what is the most specific antibody for lupus, I don't know what the correct answer would be, because the Smith antibody, which is S small m, as opposed to the smooth muscle antibody, which is S big m, is equally specific as the double-stranded DNA. So if they ask that question, I don't know which one I'd guess. But this is a fair question on the boards. What's the most sensitive? ANA 100%. Most specific, DNA or Smith. Typically in blacks, it will be the Smith more than the whites, and vice versa for the DNA, although that does not hold true all the time. So the point I want to make about this is that this person pictured here, who has a typical lupus rash, and I will point out what's typical about it, this person may have this rash with an ANA and a DNA, and therefore will say, they have lupus. From a medical legal standpoint, we're allowed to say they have probable lupus because to fulfill the research criteria, you must have four out of the 11. That is so people can be grouped and randomized into like groups so that for the testing of drugs, everything is standardized. There are many problems with this. It's beyond the scope of the lecture, but understand that autoimmunity is a big community and under the heading, Lupus is the number one thing, and you have your criteria. We're going to go through them. Before I get to them, I'll re-interrupt myself again. We briefly spoke about myopathy or myositis and lupus uh, before one or two of you came in. I, I'm going to take another step back. Lupus is a B-cell dysfunction. so. 
for those of you who say, what's an ANA or what's lupus? And you know, what do I tell the patients? The answer in summary is that there is a dysfunction of B cells. As you guys know, um, B cells are one of the lymphocytes and mature B cells are plasma cells. And it's been recently discovered that B lymphocyte stimulation factor or stimulatory factor, which is also known as bliss, has led to the new drug Benlisto or Benlimumab. This is the first drug approved for lupus in 58 years. There are only three other drugs that are indicated, or I'm sorry, FDA approved in the treatment of lupus. 1948, aspirin was approved for lupus. Several years later in the 50s, Plaquenil and Prednisone were approved for lupus. So there are only four drugs that are FDA approved for lupus. In spite of the too numerous to count scenarios that I can tell you. And I'll go further by telling you that the prednisone approval, while I agree with it and it's wonderful, can be dosed in so many different ways, I would consider it a different drug at different doses. The person taking five milligrams of pred prednisone daily to control their disease is not the same as giving a thousand milligrams a day for three days for the person with acute renal failure related to lupus. So keeping these things in mind, I've given you a lot of food for thought. Um, I want to mention one more thing before I go to the slides because I'm thinking about it. Raynaud's phenomena. Raynaud's phenomena is defined as I like to be a purist. Everything has to be defined. Because if we don't define things, mistakes occur. Similar to a case we were discussing before of somebody who does not have lupus with polymyalgia rheumatica. And this is because we have to be strict on our definitions. Um, Raynaud's phenomena is a reversible spasm of blood vessels with a characteristic triple phase color response that lasts anywhere from five to 60 minutes and is characterized by cold burning numbness, typically exacerbated by cold or emotional stress. This is the definition of Raynaud's. You can argue, you can tell me something else, that is the definition. There is Raynaud's phenomena and there's Raynaud's disease. If a patient with an illness in autoimmunity, namely lupus, has Raynaud's, Raynaud's is not in the diagnostic criteria for lupus. So if you see a patient with Raynaud's or you think has Raynaud's, yes, they may have lupus, but it is not usable as the fourth criteria. It should not be thought of as one of the criteria. It is so sensitive and lacks specificity that only in limited scleroderma does it even fall into the criteria. So Sjogren's gets it, myositis gets it, interstitial lung disease gets it, rheumatoid arthritis gets it, and every other autoimmune can get it. It is not part of their criteria. <coughs> Before I get completely off track, which is easy for me to do, we'll, we'll go through the slides. What I thought I would do is I'd show you a picture, describe what it is, describe why, why I think it's important, what you should know about it, discuss how the diagnosis would be made from that slide if possible, and then discuss the treatment of that issue. The first thing to notice that this is a young black male. Lupus is much more common in blacks than whites. Lupus is much more common in women than men. Women to men, nine to one. Skin disease in lupus is extraordinarily common. I'm not particularly good on certain statistics. Suffice to say, the presenting feature of lupus 
would be skin disease probably 20 or 30 percent of the time, possibly more. And during the course of the disease of lupus across the board, it, I'm sure it's more than 50 percent. I don't know exact statistics. I don't think anyone will ask you exact, exact specific um, statistics. But you should know that skin disease and lupus is very common. So this is acute lupus, acute cutaneous lupus. What makes this uh, characteristic of lupus, and you should remember this because this is extraordinarily important, because there's many mimics of this, sparing of the nasolabial fold. Nose, no good. Cheeks, no good. Nasolabial fold, normal. The classic lupus rash is not confused with anything. When it's not classic, it can be confused with a lot of things. Polymorphous light eruption. Many, many, many things. But young black male, other things that you can see in this, scalp lesions. This is a scarring lesion. This is discoid lupus. When you see a scarring lesion in discoid lupus, the hair will never grow back there again. Therefore, steroid shots to the scalp are not necessary. They're a waste of time. Plaquenil, while necessary to treat the patient, is not going to help their hair. This person will end up wearing a wig, a do-rag, or something, but they will not grow their hair back. The patient has lesions in their ear. When you see brown lesions in the ear of a lupus patient, you can bet that they are discoid lupus. There are so many lupus skin lesions, I probably can't name 10 of them. Lupus tumidus, lupus profundus, bullous lupus, subacute cutaneous lupus, discoid lupus, many more. Those are the ones that just popped in my head. Um, bullous lupus happens to be reasonably common. You should at least know that you've heard of it. And lupus profundus is actually paniculitis seen typically on the upper buttocks in a lupus patient. Again, it's important to know because if you see what looks like paniculitis or something that resembles erythema nodosum and it's on the, the buttocks of a black person, <coughs> it's more likely that it's lupus profundus than erythema nodosum. Any questions on this slide? I will address your question. Well, you know what? Okay, let's talk about the treatment of lupus skin disease now. Everybody in the world who has lupus is treated with Plaquenil. It probably takes Plaquenil a solid six months to work. Plaquenil is extraordinarily safe and nobody should, nobody should hesitate to use it. The American College of Rheumatology and the American College of Ophthalmology in the last few years changed their criteria for screening. You do not have to go to an eye doctor for five years of being on Plaquenil, and then you go once a year. It's rarely a case report that a Plaquenil patient has to stop the drug because of retinal deposit. The so-called bullseye maculopathy, which I do have a slide of here. I've never seen it in my career. I really don't intend on seeing it. When, loop, when Plaquenil was used for malaria, the doses were higher. It was more reversible deposition in the eye but people did lose their vision because if they didn't stop the drug. But to continue answering your question, if you see a patient like this walk in the office, you're gonna give them high dose steroids. And you're gonna give them very high dose steroids. You may give them pulse steroids. It depends on how angry that lesion looks on that day when they come in, and it depends if they're sick. But just based on the skin lesion alone, if they come in with a hot active lesion on their face that looks like this, that person should be hospitalized or put in an infusion center for 1,000 milligrams of daily cyamedrol for three days. They should dry up rather quickly. 
I've seen this. I've seen it um, slough an entire scalp with pulse steroids with conversion to 80 milligrams of daily solumedrol for a month in combination with methotrexate, imuran, Celsept, and Plaquenil. Now, I've also seen this where we've used Cytoxan. There's advantages, pros and cons to Cytoxan. It's obviously very dangerous, but it's also very potent. One thing that is used in refractory skin lesions, particularly discoid lupus, is thalidomide. But thalidomide is not available even to me. There are a few rheumatologists around the country who've signed up for a particular protocol where they can access thalidomide for refract refractory um, or severely recalcitrant lupus skin lesions. Um, so every lupus patient, regardless of their symptom, belongs on Plaquenil. It's felt to be disease modifying. The mechanism is felt to be the um, um, a blockage of toll receptors, T-O-L, toll receptors. This is something you will probably hear about in the next five to ten years more. So everyone gets Plaquenil. Many people are, people are on low-dose steroids. And then we have a litany of everything else, uh, DMARD, DMARD steroid-sparing drugs. I don't know if you were here when I mentioned it. There's only four drugs that have ever been approved for usage of lupus by the FDA. And by the way, with respect to Ben Lista, if you said to me, gee, you gave this guy steroids and he kind of dried up and now he's on Plaquenil and he's on a little prednisone, he's not getting actively worse, I would probably put this person on Ben Lista. Ben Lista, which is Benlimumab, which is the Bliss inhibitor, which has been available about a year, after about six months tends to help um, refractory joint and skin diseases. It doesn't seem to do much for anything else in lupus. And for what it's worth, we do have other treatments in lupus, such as IVIG, which we use for hemolysis. Um, and as we get to other things, perhaps my mind will tell you some other things. Okay, arthritis in lupus, very common. Um, like skin disease, it can be the presenting feature a large percentage of the time. And like skin disease, it probably occurs, probably more so than skin disease, it probably occurs in 60 or 80 percent of all lupus patients at some point in the course of their disease. Um, this x-ray shows several characteristic features of lupus, as does the hand on the left, which represents that x-ray. As everyone knows, rheumatoid arthritis is a destructive arthritis. What everyone may not know is that lupus arthritis is a non-destructive arthritis. It is an arthritis where we get swelling and tenderness of joints without erosions, without destruction. But you can see ligament laxity and subluxations. You can see the MCPs are all subluxed. These subluxations are all reducible, meaning if you push them back, they go back in the normal position. This is called Jacuds arthritis, spelled J-A-C-C-O-U-D-S, Jacuds. Jacuds arthritis is a arthritis that is seen in lupus or acute rheumatic fever. I've seen it in lupus. I do see it in lupus. I have not seen it with rheumatic fever. I have not seen a case of acute rheumatic fever, but I've seen many cases of post-streptococcal arthritis, but they don't get that, this. Now the hand, if you were to look at this hand in the picture without the x-ray, you could easily make a case that this is a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Soft tissue swelling of the MCPs with probable synovitis of all the MCPs. Um, these are swan neck deformities. If you guys can't appreciate it, if you've never seen them without going into the pathophysiology, uh, pathophysiology of this, due to ligament laxity, swan neck deformities and appear like this on the x-ray. All, re all reducible, no erosion, no permanent deformity. Treatment, similar to rheumatoid arthritis. Possible joint injection, possible oral, oral steroids, mandatory Plaquenil, most likely use of pre um, 
of methotrexate. Um, can add Imuran, can add Celsept, can use Cytoxan in rare cases. Probably wouldn't use IVIG, not for, um, not for arthritis. But now our new uh, drug of choice, uh, when people fail two or three DMARDs over three to four months or so, would be to put them on Benlista. And after six months of Benlista, typically these people do remit. By the way, um, discoid lupus, the first uh, lesion, the first picture, that was one of the 11 criteria for lupus. I should tell you that discoid lupus, which was in the ear and the forehead and the scalp of that first patient, discoid lupus, discoid lupus, that in and of itself can be a separate disease. So discoid lupus, while it may be a feature of lupus, systemic lupus, may be its own disease, treatment being the same. Acute lupus rash, Maillard rash, either one of these can be a criteria of, of the 11. Either one of these can fulfill the criteria for skin lupus. Arthritis, non-deforming, non-erosive arthritis, is another one of the lupus criteria. So we've already talked about two in the first two slides. These are vasculitic infarcts. Vasculitic infarcts or vasculitis are not part of the criteria for lupus. They are part of the disease, however. So we're dealing with an inflammatory disease. Anything can happen. These can represent thrombus in somebody with phospholipid antibody disease. These can represent vasculitis in somebody who has generalized uncontrolled inflammation of blood vessels. These can represent emboli in somebody who has um, Libman, -Sach Libman Sachs endocarditis, which are thickening of valves with um, non-infectious leaf leaflets. So this would not be unusual in a lupus patient nor would it be unusual in a vasculitis patient or any other patient who has an autoimmune disease. So it's not in the criteria, it's not specific, but it's also not uncommon. This patient shows a combination of things. Gangrene, Raynaud's, discoloration, almost an appearance of sclerodactyly. The point here being that this person probably has either lupus vasculitis or this patient has phospholipid disease with multiple thrombi. Either one would fit for this picture. Since we mentioned, um, or since I mentioned phospholipid disease, I'll tell you briefly in case it doesn't come up on another slide because it's important. Phospholipid antibody syndrome is something you need to know about. Phospholipid antibodies are seen in 30% of lupus patients. Phospholipid antibodies are defined as beta-2 glycoprotein, IgM or IgG, greater than 40 or 60, up, until, up to 100. I do not know the units. Each lab is different. But if they're strongly positive in the face of a venous or arterial thrombus, a first trimester miscarriage, or two second trimester miscarriages, that person is said to have the phospholipid antibody syndrome. That also applies to thrombocytopenia with unexplained platelet count of under 100,000. So if you've got a platelet count of under 100,000 and you have the beta-2 glycoprotein, which is the gold standard test for the phospholipid antibody testing as opposed to the lupus anticoagulant testing, essentially the same, different testing, but if you were to be asked, which of the following is the most specific test for lupus anticoagulant, I'm sorry, which of the following is the most specific test for phospholipid antibody disease, the answer would be beta-2 glycoprotein. And it would be reported out as IgA, IgM, and IgG. 
IgG is the most important and IgA's significance is not known. The higher the level, the more significant it is. Not only will you have the things I mentioned such as the thrombosis or the miscarriage or, or the thrombocytopenia, headaches, migraines, depression, transverse myelitis, and many other things, uh, chorea, are all associated with, in some way or fashion, with phospholipid antibody disease. And again, the reason it's in this lecture is to point out that about 30% of people with lupus have phospholipid antibodies. I'll say one other thing. Frequently, you'll notice on the floors, people order a lupus anticoagulant. The only test that matters when you order a lupus anticoagulant is the diffuse, Ru Russell, Vi diffuse Russell Viper Venom Time, the DRVVT. If the DRVVT is elevated, then you have a positive lupus anticoagulant. If the test comes back and says the lupus anticoagulant is positive and the DRVVT is low, they do not have a positive lupus anticoagulant. I would consider that a lab error or a lab mistake or misreporting. Okay, this rash, this annular rash, which could be virtually whatever you want it to be, is actually characteristic of subacute cutaneous lupus. The important thing to know about subacute cutaneous lupus is one, that it exists. Two, it can, it can suffice for the criteria for lupus. But most importantly, if you have an isolated positive SSA, this is one of the four causes of a positive SSA, subacute cutaneous lupus. It mimics um, rashes and rheumatic fever, uh, which is called erythema marginatum. It mimics granuloma annulare. It mimics ringworm. But anyway, just know that there's such a thing called subacute cutaneous lupus. And it is seen with a positive SSA only, nothing else. This here is what used to be referred to as cotton wool spots. Cotton wool spots are nothing more than retinal vasculitis. Usually when I, I think of vasculitis as a rheumatologist, I think of uh, stenosis and dilatation of vessels and I think of beating of blood vessels. But in the retina, things are a little bit different and we get these little hemorrhages and exudates and they're referred to as cotton wool spots. I'm emphasizing the term cotton wool spots because you may see it on the boards. They don't know if you care about retinal vasculitis or know a thing about retinal vasculitis. They want you to know the spleen has on onion skinning and the retina has cotton wool spots. These are more hemorrhages in the retina. Um, so since we have two slides on retinal hemorrhages, obviously you should realize that I'm showing them to point out that eye exams are important in lupus patients and not because they're taking Plaquenil. People who have lupus of the central nervous system can easily have retinal disease as well and lose their vision. There is almost no neurologic or ocular manifestation listed anywhere regarding any disease that cannot or will not be seen in lupus. This may be the slide of the bullseye maculopathy. I hope there's a better one. But in theory, this is a bullseye in the macula. I think there might be a better one, but if there isn't, this is the bullseye maculopathy of Plaquenil toxicity. You will never see this in your clinical practice. You may hear about it, you may read about it. I emphasize may. Rheumatology, 21 years. Haven't seen it yet, haven't heard about it yet. But before the 70s, happened commonly. Um, and it's a diagnostic of Plaquenil toxicity. So if on the boards they ask about Plaquenil toxicity, the answer is possibly bullseye maculopathy. This specimen, which I believe to be a skin biopsy or a renal biopsy, I can't even tell, shows that there is bright immunofluorescence. I believe this is a skin biopsy. This skin biopsy shows the dermal epidermal junction. 
So here's the, likely the outside of the skin, epidermis, dermis, dermal epidermal junction. The pathology in lupus is abnormal staining for IgA, IgG, IgM complements all at the dermal epidermal junction. There are other conditions that have abnormalities at the dermal epidermal junction. Um, pemphigus gives you abnormalities at the dermal epidermal junction. So don't take for granted that it's automatically lupus. But if you have a complement or immune globulin deposition at the dermal epidermal junction, you're dealing with lupus on a skin biopsy. We're switching now to kidneys. We're entering another organ system. I have a few kidney slides here. I'm going to go through them and then tell you a little bit about them. We may actually have less pictures than I thought, and I apologize. And I may be going the wrong way. I don't know. OK. Um, what, what I'd like you to see here is everyone here sees the glomeruli. This is all very thickened. There's excess cells. This is diffuse. This would be focal, but this is the main area of the slide. Lupus of the kidney has a classification system that goes from one to six. But there's also chronicity um, and other grading systems. So this type of a slide would be reported to you as diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. The reason that diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis is important is this is treated with cytoxan. Cytoxan is not FDA approved for lupus, but the only treatment for diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, or DPGN, is cytoxan. Pulse cytoxan, IV cytoxan, not oral cytoxan. I realize they don't have any pictures of the lungs, but I do want to make a point. One of the main areas where we use oral cytoxan in lupus is in pulmonary hemorrhage. We can talk about at the end, any organ system I missed, but I always like to mention that pulmonary hemorrhage is treated with two milligrams per kilogram of cytoxan, whether it's IV or PO, as opposed to one gram a day or a milligram per meter square, which is approximately a gram. Um, and it would be done, not, I'm sorry, not daily. It would be given monthly for six months followed by quarterly for another 18 months. That's in combination with high-dose steroids. Many studies are currently ongoing looking at the use of Celsept in place of Cytoxan due to the toxicity of Cytoxan. When, usi when using Cytoxan in young females, you need to have them store eggs because uh, the Cytoxan side effects include uh, destroying your eggs the other cytoxan side effects include cancers, namely hematologic malignancies, bladder cancers and hematuria with hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic cystitis. Um, and one more that's just not in my mind right now. Um, skin cancers, hematologic cancers, bladder cancer, hemorrhagic cystitis. That'll be good enough for the boards. So anyway, I show you this as, as a severe lesion. Of the criteria for lupus in the skin biopsy, I'm sorry, in the kidney biopsies, focal sclerosis, which would be characterized as lesion number six, is a non-treatable lesion because the whole thing is sclerosed you would just see a, a ball that looked like a bowling ball in the glomerulus. It's, a, it's just a waste. And the first lesion is essentially normal. The ones that are really important would be what the nephrologists like to call stage three and stage four. This would be a, or a class three and class four. This would be a class four lesion 
where you have diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. But again, I like to try and simplify things. This does not have to be made any more difficult than it already is. When the pathologist reports back that this is what they have, or you clinically suspect that this patient who's laying there in the bed with lupus is peeing blood, has active urinary sediment, has a rising creatinine, you better pulse them with steroids and give them a gram of cytoxan empirically. You will not harm anybody by giving an empiric gram of cytoxan. No matter how many fights I've had with the nurses and the PharmD at this hospital, one gram of cytoxan will not hurt anybody in this room given one time. And it should not be held back from anybody for virtually any reason if it's going to save their life. Clearly this lesion here is not a cytoxan lesion. This is more sparse. What you see here are thickening of mesangial loops. When you see mesangial thickening, and that's the predominant feature, this is a cell sept person. This could even be a nephrotic syndrome patient. So if you don't have diffuse disease with coalition of the glomeruli with an increased cellular infiltrate and you have nephrotic syndrome, or you have uh, non-nephrotic proteinuria, the treatment of choice in those people is no longer cytoxan. The treatment for those people is Celsept. Celsept is mycophenolate mofetil. The typical dose is three grams daily in split doses. The pills come in 500 milligram tablets, and it's two tablets three times a day. That's the dose. Different specialties for different reasons, whether it be transplant or what have you, occasionally use four grams. But the important thing is to know that if you want to kind of um, black box lupus kidney disease, you have your cytoxan lesions, you have your cell sep lesions, but they all need to be addressed. And of course, don't forget that if you're dealing with a nephrotic patient, you have to treat the nephrotic syndrome. You have the risk of renal vein thrombosis. Every time you're spilling protein, you're spilling clotting factors, you're spilling other proteins. You have all the other complications, cholesterol, edema, everything. This here is a kidney biopsy. This is a kidney biopsy showing positive immunofluorescence throughout the glomeruli. I couldn't tell you if this were IgG or complements, but nonetheless, if you see a stain like this, and again, I've seen these on internal medicine boards, rheumatology boards, they just want you to recognize that there is positive immunofluorescence. This is what it looks like. And when you have a diffuse immunofluorescent pattern within the kidney, they don't expect you to be a renal pathologist. They simply expect you to recognize that this is seen in lupus nephritis. And it's unlikely they would ask you based on this picture, what's the treatment? But I would guess just by looking at this, that this would probably be a non-cytoxan kidney. Uh, I would guess this would be somebody who needs prednisone and Celsept. I don't see so much coalition of uh, glomerulus together. I see a lot of, uh, I see tons of thick uh, basement membrane, capillary membrane. Um, so anyway, that would just be my opinion about this slide. Okay, so believe it or not, the criteria for lupus hasn't changed. So the fact that the slide is old is irrelevant. Um, we went through a lot of the 11 criteria already. We probably hit six or seven of them. So let's just go through them all. Before I go through them, because I don't know if they're listed, are the autoimmune antibodies. And ANA is one of the criteria. Okay? Um, what constitutes a positive ANA? 1 to 40 is generally considered negative. 1 to 640 is typically considered somewhat of a cutoff. Although, if it's 640 or more, you should start to worry that something is wrong. If you have an ANA of 1 to 640 with a centromere pattern, that person has a form for us of limited scleroderma. Centromere pattern is probably the only pattern that actually means anything in my clinical practice. Because any pattern other than centromere 
is very nonspecific and meaningless. But if somebody has a centromere antibody, they have limited scleroderma, especially if they're 640 or more. In my office, we have a Quest lab, and we insist that they titrate the titers to endpoints, which means you will never see in my office a titer of greater than or equal to 1280. You will see 2560, you will see 5200, you will see 10,000. You will see whatever the actual number is. So if somebody has an ANA of 1 to 10,000, that person has an autoimmune disease. I can't tell you which one. They could have lupus, Sjogren's, RA, they can have all of them. But at 640, they might, not have, they might have nothing. They might have autoimmune thyroid disease without disease. They might have Hashimoto's thyroid trait. So it is important not to see greater than or equal to 640, 1280, or what have you. Anything over 12, um, 1280 is significant for something. The question is, what is the something, and how significant clinically is that something? This is extremely important to know clinically. OK, um, so A and A, I'm getting that off the table now. That's a criteria. The double-stranded DNA, that's obviously a cr criteria as well. Now, you can substitute the Smith antibody as well, because they're both very, very specific, more than 95% specificity. Um, we also have hematologic parameters. An unexplained white count of under 4,000 can be seen in a normal African-American person. But in a white person, or in some African-Americans, this is not normal for them. And if you have more than two several months apart, this would now be another criteria for lupus if it remains unexplained as to why you have this, whether it be drug-induced, toxin-induced, toxin or otherwise. Further, lymphocytes are another criteria for lupus, although they do fall under the same category as um, the white blood count. A lymphocyte count of under 1,000 is another diagnostic criteria for lupus. It cannot be used in addition to the white count, but either a lymphocyte count, an absolute lymphocyte count less than 1,000, on two occasions, more than a few months apart, <coughs> along with, I'm sorry, not along with, but independent of a uh, white count of 4,000 or less would be another criteria for lupus. Same goes for platelet counts unexplained under 100,000. Um, with regard to hemoglobin, there's no specific hemoglobin, but sick lupus patients tend to be anemic. Hemolytic anemia is not a criteria, but it's also common in lupus. Okay, let's go with the list here. Mouth sores are common in lupus. The important thing about lupus mouth sores are they are painless. Painful mouth sores are typically viral or some other illness. Arthritis, I've mentioned this, it's non-erosive. It can mimic RA, it can be small joint, large joint, symmetric, asymmetric. But in the right clinical scenario with the right blood testing, it very well um, is seen frequently. Serositis is common. We see it in the form of pleurisy, we see it in the form of pericardial effusions, and we see it in the form of um, uh, abdominal serosal uh, pain. To kind of jump aside for one second, um, I had a very unfortunate case when I first came here. I get a call from the operating room. It was like my first month in practice. Guy calls me up from the operating room and he says, um, we have a patient in the operating room who we took, who has lupus. We took them to the operating room. I opened up their belly and I found the largest spleen I've ever seen. I took it out. What should I do now? Anyone know what to do now? Well, you're cheating because I told you the answer. Okay. Abdominal pain and lupus is not caused from a big spleen. It's either from serositis or mesenteric arteritis. These are not detectable on any study. If there's not enough serosal fluid to see, you're not going to see it on a CAT scan. If you do an angiogram, the blood vessels that are small, which are going to cause thumbprint, thumbprinting and bowel edema, you're not going to see them. So you're going to make an educated guess that a patient with lupus or any other autoimmune disease who has unrelenting abdominal pain has either serositis or mesenteric arteritis. Now, if they have pleuropericarditis, 
bet is, is that they probably have serositis. If they're an otherwise vasculitic patient or they're really sick, more than likely it's vasculitic. And if they happen to perforate their bowel, you have your answer even more. Nonetheless, the treatment is steroids. Taking out someone's large spleen, you've just removed half their blood. Nonetheless, that patient died 30 minutes after the phone call. And the guy thought that I was joking when I said put the spleen back. This non-board certified surgeon is still practicing here. Oh, back to, uh, back to uh, pleurisy and pericarditis. Lung involvement is common in lupus. The most common uh, lung involvement happens to be pleurisy. You can get lupus alveolitis, lupus pneumonitis. You can have a shrinking lung syndrome. Whether these things are important for you guys at your level, I don't know if they are or not. But you should know that the lupus does involve the lung. It's not uncommon. Probably 30 to 50% of patients with lupus have lung involvement. And pleurisy is by far the most common. Um, for what it's worth, if you want to try and distinguish clinically between pleuritis or pleurisy and pericarditis, pleurisy gets worse with a deep breath. And uh, pericardial effusions tend to change with uh, position. Somebody leans forward in bed, their pain goes away, it was pericarditis. Now, here's a factoid. Pleuritis and, I'm sorry, Pleurisy and pericardial effusions seen together in the absence of heart failure or cancer are almost always seen in lupus. They're not seen in scleroderma. They're not, not seen in Sjogren's. They're seen in lupus. So let's talk about the heart since we have pericarditis there. Again, what I want you to know is that cardiac disease is not uncommon in lupus. Not as common as pulmonary, but probably 30 to 45% of people with lupus during the course of their disease or even in presentation, and I've seen people with lupus present with pericardial effusion, I've seen lupus present with pleural effusion. Nothing more, nothing less. Positive ANA, positive DNA, and either pleurisy or pericarditis. Now, they only have three criteria. Dr. Soloway, you just said they have to have four criteria. For research purposes, they have to have four criteria. But if you can tell me another disease that gives you an ANA, a DNA, and pleurisy or pericardial effusion, I'd be very curious what that disease is. So what do you do? You don't give NSAIDs. NSAIDs are used for pericardial effusions not related to lupus. They're used for viral pericarditis. Steroids are used in lupus pericardial effusions. That's not to say that mistake won't be done a hundred times. And for the record, indocin is no better or worse than anything else. It just may have been studied more for that condition a million years ago, as in gout. Indocin's no better in gout than any other NSAID. Never been proven to be, never will be. Anyway, I want to point out to you that you should all know that lupus involves the heart. It involves the conduction system. It involves the valves. The valves you need to know about. The valves you're going to hear about. The valves are going to be on the exams. Libman, L-I-B-M-A-N, Sachs, S-A-C-K, S, and if I spelled it wrong, I'm sorry, could be C-H. I'm not a good speller, I'm tired. Um, thickening of the mitral leaflets, most common location. And for the record, most common valve lesion in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome happens to be thickening of the mitral leaflets. Go figure. The importance of this condition is it can mimic endocarditis and it's not uncommon. In autopsies, probably 75% of lupus autopsies, which probably are underdone, do show cardiac involvement. Another thing of mention, which probably not worth the mention, but just so you hear it, myocarditis, which is um, inflammation of the myocardium, is another issue in lupus. It's a clinical diagnosis with tachycardia and fever, but uh, generally speaking, your lupus patient who's sick is going to be getting steroids and you're probably not going to notice it unless they're tachycardic and you think they're dehydrated and septic, but you give them steroids and they get better. Do I sound like a general internist today? Maybe. Okay, renal. Well, the story with renal disease is, um, it's quite complex, quite frankly. Uh, really nobody knows what to do with these people. I gave you some guidelines before. If you have proliferative lesion, not mesangial proliferative, 
but diffuse proliferative. Diffuse proliferative lesion, or one thing I didn't mention before, RPGN, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. These are the two lupus lesions that are treated immediately with high dose IV uh, cytoxan along with a three day pulse of steroids. What you do with them after that really doesn't matter for a short period of time because you cannot repeat the cytoxan for a month. Um, you can get other problems in lupus. You can, I'm sorry, you can get other problems in kidney disease in a lupus patient. Right now we don't deal with NSAIDs that much, but NSAIDs cause, it, cause interstitial nephritis. Um, pretty much anything you can think of can occur in lupus of the kidney, but, but the most important is the glomerulonephritis, the nephrotic syndrome. Um, the persistent proteinuria, by definition, to fulfill the criteria for lupus, 500 milligrams of protein in 24 hours. So if a person has 500 milligrams or more of protein in 24 hours that does not have another explanation such as diabetes or hypertension, that person may very well have lupus nephritis. What do you do? You do a kidney biopsy. Um, ultrasound guided fine needle aspirate of the kidney, um, get 10 or 20 glomeruli, the thing gets them sent to a renal pathologist, they report back to you a very nice report, um, tells you what to do pretty much, uh, essentially the way I break it up, it's either a cytoxan lesion or it's a cell sep lesion, because they all have to be treated with something. And for the most part, at the beginning, they're all going to be on high-dose steroids. Not necessarily pulse steroids, but until you stabilize the patient, they're going to get 60 or 80 milligrams of daily prednisone, which equates to usually 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram of steroids. Um, neurologic disorder. This slide doesn't really do that justice. Literally everything that's on the list for MS is on the list for lupus. I'll go so far as to say that if you think your lupus patient has MS, they don't. What they have is CNS lupus manifesting as demyelinating lesions in a waxing and waning pattern. Now, what does that mean? Well, really nothing because you're still going to treat them with their MS meds because we don't really have good meds for CNS lupus. What do we do for CNS lupus? Well, if they have seizures, we give them seizure meds. If they have psychosis, um, we treat them as if they're psychotic. They get Haldol, they get high-dose steroids. Now, like, oh, um, remind me to go back to uh, steroid myopathy and lupus, because we were talking about myopathy before. Um, so, okay, patient is psychotic, you don't know they have lupus, you order their blood, they're sitting there in the psych ward, they're in leather restraints, and their blood is pending. You've given them Narcan, you've given them sugar, you've given them everything you're supposed to. Somebody from the family comes in, says they have lupus. What are you going to do to find out if they actually have CNS lupus? Well, the good news is, is it's, you're not going to do anything wrong because we don't have any diagnostic criteria for CNS lupus. But what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and do an MRI of the brain. You're going to look for CNS vasculitis. You're going to see if there's um, white matter lesions. You're going to look for bleeding, hemorrhage. Uh, you're going to do a lumbar puncture. Now, oligoclonal banding, which is an abnormality in MS and lupus, is not specific for either one. So it's helpful. It proves that something's wrong. It proves that their psychosis is coming from an organic brain syndrome. But you don't have a lot to hang your hat on. I would say in that patient, I would empirically give them a gram of cytoxan. Again, I don't think I'd be doing anything wrong to them, and I have nothing else to offer them. I would probably also give them high-dose pulse steroids, keeping in mind that you can get steroid psychosis, although frankly, I really don't see it very often. I have seen it. It's really not that common. Steroid psychosis is more likely to occur in people who have psychotic tendencies than your standard decent person who has lupus. You know, everything I said, starting at the beginning, with my first few statements being that blacks get lupus more than whites and young more than old. Literature indicates that women under 24 tend to die sooner or earlier than other lupus patients, especially in black females. So black female Black females with lupus under the age of 24 statistically 
die earlier than any other group of lupus patients. That being said, I've seen 80-year-old white men die of lupus renal disease. So, never say never, never say always. Just know for the board's common stuff. Um, let's see. Now, oh, um, with regard to psychosis, would somebody like to define psychosis? Good, I will. Okay, psychosis is defined by hallucinations, illusions, and delusions. Okay, great. Since you all know what they are, I'm going to review them for you. Hallucination. Hallucination is a misperception of something that is not there. Illusion. Misperception of something that is there. Delusion. False, unshakable belief. I'm driving down the road and I see a mirage. I think there's water. That's an illusion because I think there's a mirage. Um, my brain is misplacing the road. Um, hallucination. I'm hearing voices. There's no, no noise, but I'm hearing them. Something's not there. Okay, now that I've defined these things for you, but you guys already knew that already, and if you didn't, now you're one up on the group that didn't make it for this lecture. And by the way, I don't think three of you knew that answer. Anyway, being easy on you. Um, I want you to know something. Alcoholics have auditory hallucinations. Lupus and other organic brain diseases do not. They have visual hallucinations. This is one of your differentiating points. So when you meet Mr. Psychopath in the psych ward, if he has visual hallucinations, you need to consider that he has organic brain disease, either lupus or something else. If the same guy has tactile fremitus or uh, auditory hallucinations, he's a drunk with DTs, more than likely. Again, never say never, never say always. Common things occur commonly. These cliches have a reason. They usually hold true. Okay, now, believe it or not, if I'm not mistaken, I already went over these. Isn't that pretty cool? Okay, so 4,000 I was right. According to this, it's 1,500 on the lymphocytes. More important than knowing the number 1,500, really what you need to know is let's go back to what I said at the beginning again. I said that lupus is a B cell dysfunction. Well, what kind of a white cell is a B cell? It's a lymphocyte. Well, there's obviously something wrong with the lymphocytes because there's a deficiency. So that's one of the criteria for lupus. White count, lymphocytes, thrombocytopenia less than 100,000. These things, or hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, with everything else excluded, toxins, malignancies, whatever you choose, all may lead to a lupus diagnosis. I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that if you see somebody who has a hematologic issue, please order an ANA and a DNA and call me. Okay. Um, the ANA test, which is on the bottom, has to be positive. The sensitivity is 100%. There is no such thing as ANA negative lupus, okay? This is being recorded. I don't care who disputes me. What used to be considered ANA negative lupus is now called phospholipid antibody syndrome because all the ANA negative lupus people that existed, once phospholipid antibody testing became available, those poor f souls, they all had phospholipid antibody disease. So ANA lupus does not exist. If you think they have lupus and they've never had a positive ANA in their life, they don't have lupus. Speaking of having an ANA positive in your life, if there's a patient in the hospital right now with visual hallucinations and nephrotic syndrome and you do their blood today and their ANA is negative, but their ANA was 1280 last year, that person has lupus. We do not use the ANA to follow the titer, I'm sorry, we do not use the titer of the ANA to follow the disease activity. In renal disease, we use the, the complement levels and we use the double-stranded DNA. If somebody's double-stranded DNA is high, we can occasionally use that to follow disease activity. And if somebody's complements drop, we can occasionally use that to predict the onset of an acute renal failure. 
but we do not ever use the ANA, ever. LE cell preps are no longer used. An LE cell prep was a monocyte that had a stain and it had a particular formation. But it, it, you know, according to certain lupus experts or lupusologists, the LE, the LE cell prep, which is really done on the right stain with a, with a um, do a peripheral smear and look for the particular type of monocyte, some people would say that this is the most specific test in the world for lupus that ever was. But it's fallen by the wayside, it's not used. Most people probably never know what it is or how to look for it or whatever. But what's uh, important is the biologic false test for syphilis because there are actually three phospholipid antibody tests that we do. I told you two of them. One is the lupus anticoagulant, which is the DRVVT, diffuse Russell Viper Venom Time. Second is antiphospholipid antibodies, which by the way, if you write on the chart antiphospholipid antibody in the order, the clerk should appropriately say, I don't know what you're talking about, because that test should be written as beta-2 glycoproteins. If you don't order beta-2 glycoproteins, and the lady puts in um, um, phospholipid antibody testing, you're going to get the wrong test. It is similar to the, dif the, the difference between saying, please check Lyme titer. If they do the Western blot, you're in good shape. If they do the ELISA, you're wasting your time. It would be the same type of analogy. Um, anyway, the third um, phospholipid that we check is the uh, RPR. So if you've got that lupus patient with an RPR, I would just consider that another um, phospholipid antibody test. But by the way, just, um, just to make this complete, um, having an RPR positive does not correspond to the disease activity that a phospholipid antibody patient gets. So you're not going to be at risk of having DVTs, miscarriages, and thrombocytopenia with a positive RPR. But if you have a positive RPR with a negative FTA, you may have lupus. And that is one of the diagnostic criteria. Now, one of these days when they update the criteria, they will probably make some additions and deletions. And one of the deletions may be the RPR, and it may be substituted by the phospholipid antibody testing. That kind of makes sense, and it's just the way life is going in rheumatology. Okay, so um, this kind of looks like a summary, and it says here it must have four criteria simultaneously or serially. Well, one of the biggest problems I have in my office is that people think I'm stupid. Patients want to know why I don't know what they have. Because when they come in and they say, do I have lupus? Well, sir, you do have two or three of their criteria, but I can't say you have lupus for sure. Doctor, you're stupid. You don't know what I have? The guy at the gym told me I have lupus because of my skin. This is a dilemma, and you have to figure out how to talk to people and explain to them, yes, you probably have it, and yes, I'm going to treat you for it, but no, I'm not allowed to legally tell you that you absolutely have it because you may evolve into Sjogren's. You may get scleroderma. You may get polymyositis. You may get antisynthetase syndrome. You may get any autoimmune disease. And by the way, I'll throw in my by the ways, Autoimmune thyroid disease is seen with higher frequency in all these other conditions. It's another autoimmune disease. It is a cause of a positive ANA. So when you get that ANA back that you really don't know why you ordered, you should either say to yourself, God, I shouldn't have ordered that test, or let me send this to the rheumatologist so he can make me look good. You'll find a lot of them have um, Hashimoto's thyroid trait, possibly disease, but more often trait. And for the record, you should always remember that if this comes up on the boards, a person with Hashimoto's thyroid trait has high titers of thyroid antibodies, and you check their TSH yearly, and that's it. Nothing else needs to be done with them. They don't need an ultrasound unless you think or feel or see a goiter. Um, so, uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 
So there's 11 criteria up there. Uh, we covered Malar rash, that was the first slide. We covered discoid rash by serendipity because it was also in the first slide. I did not mention photosensitivity. Okay, great. So I'm glad we had the summary. Photosensitivity, meaning you walk outside on a sunny day or a bright day, you flare, your joints hurt, you feel tired, you feel weak, you feel lousy, your skin starts sloughing off. That's photosensitivity, not photophobia, photosensitivity. It is actually one of the lupus criteria. And since we're on the topic of photosensitivity, and since we're also on the topic of something I left off the list, a large percentage of lupus patients are allergic to sulfa. So, we don't know what causes lupus, but we do know that many lupus patients probably have, have a sulfa allergy. We also know that sun exposure exacerbates lupus tremendously. I advise my lupus patients to wear a hat. I advise them to put no less than sunscreen 30 that covers UVA and UVB on their face. I prefer they put it on their entire body. I advise them that clothing does not protect, does, there's no UV protection in sun, I'm sorry, in clothing, unless you're buying it at the beach shop and it's meant for protection of the sun. So in addition to these people or all of us getting skin cancer, those people really can't go in the sun because they will have flares. And if you don't believe me, spend two or three days with me and you'll see somebody. We had one yesterday. She brought a photograph of her leg. She thought it was from her, her high algan injection. And after we talked to her for five minutes, it was unexposed, um, unprotected sun exposure for a whole day with a tremendous eruption on her right thigh. She conveniently forgot that she wasn't supposed to go in the sun without sun protection. We covered the arthritis just to reemphasize the difference between lupus arthritis and lupus arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis is lupus arthritis does not give erosions. Rheumatoid arthritis is an erosive arthritis. Serositis, that means there's inflammation of serosal membranes. The serosal membranes include the pleura, the pericardium, and the abdominal cavity. Renal disorder, typically casts, which I didn't use the word too often before, protein greater than 500 milligrams in 24 hours, um, and any suspicion for renal disease, frankly, in a non-diabetic or a non-polycystic kidney or a non-hypertensive. And by the way, if your patient has those things, at least the uh, hypertension and diabetes, uh, I would never make the mistake of thinking they could not have re uh, renal lupus. And I've biopsied people who have high blood pressures and I've biopsied people who've had um, bad diabetes and I have found them to have uh, lupus lesions of the kidney. Further, there's a patient floating around the hospital now over the past several months. One of you or two of you or three of you and of course, I don't know anyone's last name, but I will tell you that there's a patient who I've seen two or three times in Elmer in the last two or three months, continually comes into the hospital with malignant hypertension, 240 over 140 on two or three occasions. Of course, I was the 90th person called on the case. They called the wrong rheumatologist. They called the other guy who was asleep or whatever. Um, I looked at this patient and um, they looked to me like they had scleroderma. I actually had an argument with the patient's mother and I said, your daughter has scleroderma. She argued with me. Anyway, I put her on 400 milligrams of captopril, stopped all of her other six blood pressure medicines and her pressure came right down to 120 over 70. So she in fact did have um, sclerodermatous changes of the kidney or the so-called hypertensive renal crisis of scleroderma in a patient who really have an overlap with scleroderma and lupus. This probably could be written up. There's normotensive renal crisis, that's been written up. Um, I've never seen a case report written up on um, an overlap of lupus with scleroderma with renal crisis. 
If you guys like writing papers, my office is a feeding ground for writing up cases. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, the ANA we talked about, the immunologic disorder, um, we probably touched on. Let me see if there's any other slides here. Okay. The renal histology we kind of talked about. Now, this is the six criteria. Um, the bottom one really fell out of favor. Membranous glomerulonephritis, which is um, when you have nephrotic syndrome, th this is uh, class five. I, I don't really remember the classes, and I don't think anybody needs to know the classes. I think if you're going to talk to a doctor, you describe what you see. So if you're going to tell me that a patient has Sturge Weber syndrome, and I say, I don't know what the hell Sturge Weber syndrome is, why don't you just tell me there's a guy with a big port wine stain and some other problems, and then I'll, at least I can visualize what I'm what I'm talking about or hearing about. But um, so normal is the, uh, the least ominous. You'll probably put this patient on an ACE inhibitor. You'll probably put this patient on Plaquenil. Well, no, if they have lupus, you're putting them on Plaquenil, but you'll probably give them an ACE inhibitor because it's safe. Mesangial, same as here. Mild focal, Celsept. Diffuse proliferative, Cytoxan. Membranous, Cellcept. Although I have one patient in the past year who came in with a tremendous amount of protein uh, and I gave her the old guarantee that she's going to be better in three to six months. It probably took 12 to 18 months, but she got better simply with Cellcept. I think out of my own nervousness, I gave her one gram of Cytoxan just to make her happy, let her know that I was doing something extra for her. Okay, here's a little bit more about um, central nervous system. The important things I think you know. Seizures, psychosis. Uh, aseptic meningitis, you need to know this. Don't give Motrin to a lupus patient because on the boards they get aseptic meningitis. That's a good one to know. Um, the list is um, pretty protean. So, you know, if you can think of a neurologic issue, it can be seen in lupus. Um, again, more of what I just said. I think it's on the next slide. This is my reminder to mention drug-induced lupus. Drug-induced lupus, well, first of all, there is no role in the world for single-stranded DNA. Completely irrelevant test. It's positive in almost everybody for no reason. The only test that means anything in lupus is a double-stranded DNA. This is for regular old systemic lupus. Drug-induced lupus will not have a double-stranded DNA. Drug-induced lupus will have an antihistone antibody. Now, in our, in our old-time standard protocols, we used to say that if a person had a single-stranded DNA and a histone antibody, they had drug-induced lupus. I think the most important thing to recognize, if you have a person who has somewhat of a lupus-like syndrome, and a lot of the drugs like procainamide, I mean, they're just not used that much anymore. But if you think somebody has drug-induced lupus for whatever reason, you're going to check their histone antibodies. But I'm going to go one step further. One of the most common drugs we use in rheumatology these days is Remicade. Remicade is a monoclonal antibody. It causes antibodies. It causes drug-induced lupus. Now, oh gosh, I don't know. I've done 500,000 Remicade infusions in 15 years or something. I'm probably estimating, but I'm probably not far off. Um, I've seen drug-induced lupus from Remicade about three or four times. I've seen positive ANAs induced by Remicade 15, 20, 30 times. I watch the ANA, I watch the symptoms. If nothing happens, I continue the treatment. So you'd want to know if your rheumatoid patient who's doing wonderful all of a sudden has a flare. You want to think, gee, maybe they have drug-induced lupus from Remicade. I've seen it happen. Uh, that reminded me, I wanted to tell you guys about um, uh, myositis and lupus and drug-induced uh, um, uh, dr uh, drug muscle weakness. Your lupus patient who has what appears to be polymyositis usually is not going to be polymyositis, usually. 
they're usually going to simply be a lupus patient who presents with muscle weakness with CPKs somewhere as between five and 25,000. They're gonna complain of proximal muscle weakness defined as, doc, I can't raise my arms to comb my hair, I can't reach for the dishes, I can't raise my leg to get in the car. That would be a typical story for proximal symmetric muscle weakness. Now, if it's severe, they may complain of um, sixth nerve, they may have gaze palsies, they may have double vision, they may have trouble swallowing solids, uh, they may have shortness of breath from diaphragmatic dysfunction. But here's the thing. You start loading them up with steroids, and they seem to be getting better. Next thing you know, they feel great, but they can't get out of bed. What do they have? What's wrong with this guy? He cannot get out of bed. But he feels great now. He's got a steroid myopathy. There's no particular dose, but what you need to know about a steroid myopathy is that it's preferential leg weakness to upper extremity weakness. In a uh, patient who typically gets 40 or 80 milligrams of prednisone a day for, I'd say, more than several weeks, if you stop the drug, it goes away immediately. Problem is, so does the problem that you just treated. So you have to be careful. That's why you need the, need the uh, so-called non-biologic DMARDs. Now, in myositis, we use a combination of methotrexate and imuran. Now, this used to be taboo to mix those two drugs because you're going to wipe out their liver. Well, now it's not taboo. Now it's great for myositis, polymyositis, dermatomyositis. Nothing treats inclusion body myositis, but in case you haven't heard of it, that's the other inflammatory myopathy rheumatoid, uh, rheumatologists treat, even though I just said there's no treatment. Okay. Um, is there any question that anyone has about this? Because just to make it simple for you, I'm going to, you know what, let me see what the next slide is. Okay. I told you about histone antibodies. Everything else is negative, okay? This is single-stranded DNA. So I, I don't, no one cares about single-stranded DNA, nor should you. Histone antibody is the board answer. Person has drug-induced lupus, you suspect that they've been on procainamide or clonopin or uh, chlorpromazine or whatever they're on. What test do you order? The test question is histone antibodies. Um, does anyone have any question about these uh, antibodies that I can answer? I'll answer questions at the end, so if, if you're afraid or shy or whatever, or if you swallowed your tongue or something. Okay, phospholipids, I did mention it. Um, okay, thrombosis, recurrent thrombosis of unknown etiology, you have to work them up for phospholipid antibody disease. Recurrent fetal loss, I defined it more specifically than this. One, fi one first trimester or two second trimester miscarriages with the right serologies, diagnostic. Thrombocytopenia, less than 100,000, unexplained. Um, Livido reticularis, I don't have a picture with me, but Pictures are common. People who have it are common. I'm willing to bet every single person in this room has seen Livido reticularis and they just didn't know what to call it. If it looks like they have freezing cold thighs that are purple with red lines running through the purple and the sun is shining through an ice cube and you get that lattice pattern, that is Livido reticularis. The reticular pattern of that sun going through the ice, okay? So when I see Livido reticularis, my thoughts are typically Maybe they just have a little dermal vasculitis for an unknown cause. Maybe they actually have a vasculitic disease. And then I consider lupus phospholipid antibody syndrome. And I, I just run through my list of possibilities because um, th there's an endless supply of autoimmune diseases. When, when, when it's said that a person can have 100 types of arthritis, what that statement really means is that there's 100 types of inflammatory disease that are associated with an inflammatory arthritis. Like I told you guys, if you were here at my rheumatoid lecture last month, I told you that rheumatoid arthritis is not a joint disease. It is a systemic autoimmune disease with a predilection for the joints. You have to think of things that way. Crohn's disease, don't think of Crohn's disease as a, as a small bowel disease. Think of it as a granulomatous disease with a predilection for the small bowel. Because you can have Crohn's disease of the brain, Crohn's disease of the muscles, Crohn's disease of the joints and sacroiliac joints, 
without having bowel disease. You can have sarcoid of every part of your body and not your lungs. You can have rheumatoid lung disease without uh, joint problems. So don't, don't ever forget these things. They may be above the scope of what a family practitioner will do, but you should have heard of them and you should know of them. Honestly, I don't know what this is. But if I had a guess, since it's a lupus lecture, I'm going to guess that it's lupus tumidus. There's a rash called lupus tumidus, and it looks like this. I would only know from a biopsy. This here is, um, as I described before, the classic lupus rash. All right, so since this is like the post-test, somebody has to tell me why is this a classic lupus, ra lupus rash and not a polymorphous light eruption or some other mimic, and you can't answer. And you can't answer. Okay, can somebody please tell me? Nasal labial sparing, yes. There's nothing else that somebody can have if they have a malar eruption with sparing of the nasal labial fold. Just remember it. And you know what? For what it's worth, if you had this person open their mouth, they're going to have a couple of painless mouth sores. If you go through their scalp, you may find a couple of discoid lesions. You're shocked. You'd be shocked what you find when you look. Absolutely shocked. This character's just got a lot of makeup on, I think. I don't know what her story is. She's got a big nose and maybe a goiter. Um, now, the only reason that I know from looking at this that this is lupus is there's a tremendous rash here, the sparing of the nasal labial fold. If I saw just this, there's no way in the world I would know that this was lupus without a biopsy. So you've got lesions. You know, the lupus lesions of the skin, they, they probably make up the most common um, manifestation of lupus, short of the ANA and the DNA. They come in every shape, size, and form. There's, there's almost nothing that isn't seen. But the answer is in the biopsy. All these biopsies have immunofluorescence at the dermal epidermal junction. If the pathologist writes back a report that says consistent with lupus, or you're kind of hazy about the report and you don't know what's going on, read the body, read the summary. If they don't mention the dermal epidermal junction, you can't make any statement about it. Nor can they. Um, this looks like it's meant to show, to show discoid lupus. There's a bald spot here. That browning of the skin. Browning of the skin. I think, I don't know if this is shadow, but this, this is not atypical. This is a little bit symmetric, but You'd see this type of thing, this type of rash, inside of an ear, and that would be very typical of discoid lupus. Um, you can have nail changes in lupus. There are no specific nail changes for lupus. I think these are actually um, some variety of spoon nails, which are seen in iron deficiency. This looks like thrush. So perhaps this is a steroid-treated patient. So even if I don't know, I can make up great stories for each slide. Okay, um, that ends my lupus presentation.